Welcome to North Dakota Hockey Central, your television home for all things UND Hockey. I'm Alex Seinert. Coming up, head coach Brad Berry stops by to discuss the return of NCHC play to the Ralph. Plus, we get to know freshman forward Harrison Blaisdell. First, though, it's time for the latest installment of UND Hockey's web series, Through These Doors. This week, the crew talks to Jacob Bernard Docker and Shane Pinso about their experience at the 2020 World Junior Championships. Shane Pinto and Jacob Bernard Docker have experienced exciting moments donning the UND jersey. Competing at the World Junior Championship, however, provided even more memories for the two emerging stars. Yeah, I think it was really cool, especially, you know, we got to play Canada, so obviously that's a big rivalry, and, you know, to start out first time, you, you know, you can feel the pressure, so, um, you know, I thought it was a good first game. You know, obviously we didn't want, uh, it didn't end the way we wanted to, but uh, I think it was a good way to start the tournament for sure. Yeah, definitely uh, weird to see him in different colors. I think, uh, you know, for us too, it's going to be something we're going to remember for a really long time, and um, you know, obviously a really special moment to uh, to be competing on an international stage against each other. Yeah, I was pretty pumped to be honest. Um, kind of, it was all a blur really. You know, you kind of can't really think about it at the time. I didn't really have time to step back and really appreciate it, but. It was obviously really cool. I tried to enjoy it as much as I can, but um, you know, Jakey got the last laugh. He got that uh, gold medal at the end, so that's all that really matters. So. Facing off against each other right off the bat made for a strange but special encounter. I think the opening face off is pretty funny. How um, you know, I kind of looked at him when he, before he went to the draw, and um, it, was, it was definitely a cool moment for both of us. And um, yeah, super special. You get. In, in the environment that we are in and together we're very tight as a group but now you go in and you, you find your way and your role within another team at a high level and uh, and then uh, if you're in the event of winning a gold medal you have a chance to do that and it's something that uh, you kind of draw back from those experiences and I know it's been a long time since I've done that but I, I still draw back to those experiences every day. Looking back at his journey thus far, JBD appreciates the path he took to win gold. A really exciting moment for me and my family and um, everyone that's helped me get here I think um, you know North Dakota is a big reason why I was able to, uh, to make it this year and my teammates here and, and the coaching staff here so I'm um, just thankful for everyone that's helped me along the way and I think just you know not making it last year just kind of motivated me um, you know there's a little bit extra in the summer to uh, put some extra work in and um, you know ended up being up. First individually, I think what it does is it, it boosts your, your confidence or your level uh, of where you can get to. I, you can already see with both those guys coming back here, you know, they add a level of confidence and, and ability that they, they presented in the, in the start of the second half here. But, but as a team here, you know, they've, uh, they, they, they bring in a kind of a, a little bit more of a swagger here too of, you know, uh, doing something, accomplishing something, uh, you know, with a, with a team over the Christmas holidays. And, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, those two guys are very important on our team, but we have other guys here too, uh, collectively, that, uh, that are going to mesh together. I think, uh, you know, I had goosebumps the whole time. So, um, you know, seeing that, that, uh, that flag go up and, uh, you know, having my arms around my teammates, uh, something I'll definitely never forget. Through their respective experiences at the World Juniors, the two have their eyes set on another collective goal. I kind of just focused on the task at hand when I was over there, um, you know, just to rep represent my country, like I said, but now, you know, I'm back here and the main focus is just this team. Um, you know, I love it here and um, 
just want to win a national championship here, so that's the main goal right now. No, obviously, I had, a, I had a really good experience there, but I don't think it changed much with our, our mentality here. And um, you know, obviously, coming to the rink, wanted to work every day, and um, not getting complacent about where we are right now. And um, you know, we still got a long ways to go, and at the end of the day, uh, haven't accomplished anything yet. So, we hadn't had a whole lot of adversity in the fact of losing games in the first half, and you know, we lost the first one uh, on Friday night against Omaha. And you know, the resiliency our guys have in our group to to get back on the horse again and get back into the win column, and, and knowing what you have to do to, to, to get there. So, you know, our guys have learned uh, uh, you know a lot of lessons along the way, and uh, but I do think there's a there there. There's a quiet confidence within our group that believes that we can get the job done. Good stuff as always from Cassie Niles, Tyler Hasted, and the entire Through These Doors team. Coming up next on North Dakota Hockey Central, Brad Berry joins us to look back at the first conference series of the new year for the nation's top ranked squad. Welcome back to North Dakota Hockey Central, where we are joined, as always, by UND head coach Brad Berry from inside Ralph Engelstad Arena. Brad, thanks for the time. Absolutely, Alex. Your team got back into NCHC play this past weekend against Omaha. Game one Friday didn't go your way. What stood out to you in the 6-3 defeat? Uh, you know what? It all started with probably the uh, first couple shifts of the game. They get, a, they get a quick win on us, and now we're chasing the game here. And uh, uh, you, you never want to try to try to do that. You want to try to get into the game early on here. and. Uh, uh, when you give a team a one nothing lead, then you're then you're falling behind and you're chasing here. So it kind of got us off off a little bit. You know, I thought our sharpness we weren't uh, we weren't there as far as puck execution, as far as our uh, passing and receiving abilities. Uh, uh, you know, all the way up and down the ice. And then probably uh, lastly is our our energy or our uh, you know intensity of the game. I thought uh, you know we were we were down a couple levels on that uh, where you know, normally you have to be at the highest, especially in NCHC play. Yeah. Friday's defeat snapped a 15-game unbeaten streak and was just your second loss of the year. Obviously, you don't ever plan on losing, but after such a long, record-breaking run of success, odds were that this was going to happen sooner or later. Yeah, you know what? It's it's one of those things where you know, in sports, perfection you can't ever attain perfection, but you can attain excellence. You know, we were surely weren't excellent, uh, you know, on Friday night, and, and we knew that. I think the one thing that that goes into it too is. You know, uh, collectively as a group, I think everybody was off a little bit. Uh, and uh, sometimes when you when you have most of your group going and only a couple of guys that don't bring bring that that execution or that intensity, you can get by with it. But I think on this night we had we had a lot of guys that that probably weren't didn't bring didn't have their best games. I should say. You haven't had to deliver many post game speeches after defeats this year. What did you tell the team after game one? Well, first of all, you know, I had my thoughts, but I, I wanted to hear uh, I wanted to hear them. You know, I think as a coach or a coaching staff, you always try to present a message and you, you, you always try to present a, a direction that you want your team to go in. But I think uh, in this situation, you know, after sustaining our first loss in a long time, I wanted to hear from our guys and what they thought. And you know what, to a man, uh, you know, they were dead on exactly what us as a coaching staff thought. Uh, as far as uh, the things that didn't occur in that game and uh, you know what they were addressed on Saturday morning It was a tough day and uh, you know uh, instead of glossing over and saying hey It's just another loss and let's get back at it not leaving it to chance of having direct conversations with individuals lines D pairs and, and the whole group yeah. Saturday provided an opportunity to bounce back and you did just that with a lineup that looked a little different from the night before Talk about the decision to shake things up for game number two 
Well, you know, one thing that a loss does, it provides a chance of maybe opportunity for other guys to come in the lineup. And we're all about having second chances, and Adam Shield got a second chance to go in the net. But, you know, in, in other situations of, of trying to get guys like Casey Johnson, Josh Rieger, you know, Johnny Takana comes back in the lineup, they all, uh, they all did a really good job. You know, Casey scores a big time goal to get us going, uh, to get us the first goal of the game. Had a great chance to score uh, his second of the game there, but Seville made a great save on him. But having these guys come in that are hungry and eager to get in the lineup and, uh, and to give you a spark, that's a big deal. Yeah, certainly. Well, your team looked dialed in from the start on Saturday and you built a 3-0 advantage through the opening 20 minutes. What was working in that first period that wasn't the night before? I think guys be playing fight tight together as a five-man unit up and down the ice. Uh, you know, our forecheck on getting in on pucks, so just not the first guy, but the second and third guy getting around a puck and just being a lot closer to the place together, supporting each other was a big deal. I thought on Friday we were extended. You know, we didn't have the energy uh, that we did on Saturday, and I thought Saturday, uh, you know, we, were, we played more as a team. Yeah. Omaha had a chance late to make things interesting, but you killed off a five-minute major midway through the third to seal the win. Your penalty kill was 5-for-5 five five this weekend and is now 10-for-10 10 10 in 2020. How good was that unit against traditionally one of the best power plays in the country? Yeah, you know what? They did a really good job. And, uh, you know, we, I think we only killed one penalty on Friday night, but we uh, obviously had to get called upon a lot more on Saturday. Even, the, uh, I guess, the five-minute major at the end of the game, uh, that was a big deal, even though that we were up. Uh, four to one in the game. It was a situation where we, you know, you're, you're out there killing for five minutes, and, and you know, if they score a goal, they, they still get the crack of the whole five minutes. So, you know, to get through the first part of the kill and sustain, a, you know, a really good penalty kill through the whole five minutes, it was a big deal. And uh, I think it goes into a lot of different things as far as you know, uh, our tandems up front working together, our D men making sure that they're holding lines and 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 getting hard around pucks in our end of the rink. As you mentioned, Adam Scheele wasn't at his best on Friday, but he returned to form 24 hours later with a solid 18 save performance. How important was this 4-1 win for him and for the team in terms of regaining confidence? Yeah, you know, I think it's one of those things where, uh, you know, if you don't play your best on a certain night, uh, as in the case on Friday, uh, you want to have a chance to, to prove right away that, uh, you know, you want to get back on the horse and get going again. You know, it's, it's kind of nice that you never want to lose a game, but if you do, it's on a Friday night, so you at least you have Saturday to get back after instead of waiting till the whole week to try to get back at it again here. So, you know, we, our guys answered the bell. They, they, they responded to uh, uh, not a very good night on Friday, and now uh, we have to make sure we have a good week of practice going forward here. If there's one concern coming out of this weekend, it's the health of a pair of your top defensemen. Jacob Bernard Docker was a scratch for game two with a lower body injury that he sustained on Friday. Well, Colton Pullman was banged up and didn't play in the third period on Saturday. What can you tell us about their status moving forward? Yeah, so with JBD, you know, he sustained a lower body injury there on Friday. And, you know, uh, it's one of those things where he went through a battery of tests and, you know, he uh, just had a... a Probably the player safety side of it, we kept him out on, on Saturday. You know, he's getting better each and every day here. And, uh, you know, we'll know more through the week as far as his availability this weekend. But he's trending in the right direction. With Colton Pullman, he, uh, you know, he, he didn't end the game. I uh, played a lot, of, a lot of minutes on the weekend here. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things where we'll do the same with him. And uh, we'll go through our week. There are two big players in our lineup as far as, you know, a big part of our success. But, you know what, we have other players here too that, uh, that have done a really good job. And, uh, and, and have created a situation of, uh, of really good depth with our group. Yeah, you guys have been stepping up all season. Your next test is on the road in Oxford against the Miami team that's coming off a split of their own. You swept the Red Hawks in Grand Forks in November, but you expect a better challenge from Chris Bergeron's side this time around. 100%. Yeah, you know what? Uh, He's a guy that's come in and made a direct impact on their group. Uh, I thought they played well here when they were in our rink and, uh, uh, you know, he's probably had a more chance to get together and work together as a group on what he wants with his, how he wants his, his team to play. Uh, just noticing through some pre-scout and video, you know, they've, they've won two of their last three games and, and a couple games on the road in tough environments. So, you know, they're playing well together as a team and we got to make sure that we're aware of that and uh, uh, at the same time, you know, accentuate what we do as a team as far as the way we have to play. Another pair of important conference games on the way. Safe travels, Brad. Best of luck this weekend. Thanks a lot, Alex. Coming up after the break, we'll hear from one of Coach Barry's high-flying freshmen. A sit-down with Harrison Blaisdell is on the way. Welcome back. 
Forward Harrison Blaisdell has been a staple in the lineup more often than not in his first year in Grand Forks. The Winnipeg Jets draft pick talks about growing up in England and explains why his class gets along so well in the latest installment of Meet the Freshman. I'm Harrison Blaisdell, I'm from Regina, Saskatchewan, and I play for the University of North Dakota. My dad, he played pro hockey in uh, North America and then he went overseas to Great Britain and uh, at the time he was, he was coaching so uh, I was born in, in Sheffield, England and then I lived there for two years while he was coaching the Sheffield Steelers and then I uh, moved to Nottingham, England for the next two years and then came back home to Regina when I was about five years old. I remember hanging around the rink a lot and there was this little cafe that I went to every day after practice with my dad and I, I ordered, it's kind of like a British thing, but I ordered uh, beans on toast and that was, that was my like lunch kind of breakfast thing. I would eat that every single day. I would play mini sticks with a trainer and he would buy me a Twix bar every day. So that was my, kind of my two memories from that. I think it was something that was always kind of a part of me. My, uh, my grandpa Wally, he, he, he played, and then obviously my dad, he played in the NHL and played, played pro hockey for like about 10 years, I guess. So uh, it was always a big influence in my life. Right away, I was always introduced, you know, as soon as I was born, I was, I think I was at a Sheffield Steelers game seven days after I was born. So it was just, it's just always been a part of me. I think hanging around the rink at a young age, it just kind of translated to me falling in love with it and just basically making this what I want to do for the rest of my life. Uh, the RBC Cup Final, uh, we obviously we hosted it in Chilliwack and so we had around 5,000 of our own fans and the atmosphere was incredible and obviously we won that which was just insane and it was that, that was one of my most fond memories and then two years ago in, in Truro, Nova Scotia when we won uh, the gold medal at the World Junior A Challenge. The people at Truro obviously really embraced our team too and we, were, we, we had the opportunity to beat the Americans in the final so that was a really cool thing for us. I'm a big lake guy. I, uh, I love to fish and then I love uh, wake surfing and then wakeboarding and stuff like that. So um, I'm pretty, pretty laid back, you know, I, uh, I like to spend time on the beach. Uh, there's not a whole lot of things. <laughs> I, uh, I've always been pretty athletic growing up. I was, uh, I was a good lacrosse player. I, uh, I kind of gave that up for hockey a few years ago, but that was definitely something that I, that I enjoyed and it was pretty good at. And then, uh, I don't know, I, I'm a pretty good wake surfer. And other than that, uh, I played a lot of soccer too growing up in England. So that was something that I was, I was pretty good at. I'm, I'm kind of open to different things. You know, I, uh, I do obviously love a good comedy, but then, um, you know, action movies and the odd horror movie. Horror movies scare me a little bit, but uh, I, I, I bounce back and forth. We kind of bounce off each other really well. Um, obviously, there's there's a lot of different personalities. I think I'm, I'm a little more outspoken, and then there's uh, a few of us are kind of more on the quiet side, but I think when we get together, we're, uh, we're all super comfortable with each other now, so there's a lot of laughs, and uh, we've become really close. I'm Harrison Blaisdell, I'm from Regina, Saskatchewan, and I play for the University of North Dakota. After spending the last two weekends in Grand Forks, Blaisdell and UND get back on the road this week. We will preview their series in Miami when North Dakota Hockey Central returns. Time now to brief you on what's going down in college hockey around the nation, starting with this week's USCHO.com poll. After splitting with Omaha, North Dakota is now tied for the number one ranking with Cornell of the ECAC, while Minnesota State, the only 20-win team in the country, remains a close third. Denver and Duluth continue their gradual ascent with both moving up three spots over the last four polls. They're each in the top ten. 
There's not much difference between the pairwise and the top 20 this week until you look at the bubble. Bowling Green, who's led by Bismarck's Alec Rahauser, is 15th in the polls, but they're down to 24th in pairwise, well outside NCAA consideration at this point. Just below them, by the way, is Omaha, whose win in Grand Forks moved them up seven spots to 27. As we look at the current NCHC standings entering the weekend, Duluth picked up four points in their series against Western, so they're now just one game back of UND in the race for first. Meanwhile, DU's attempting to join the Penrose Cup chase as the Pios were the only team that swept last weekend, taking two games from St. Cloud to tighten their grip on third place while sending the Huskies into the NCHC cellar in the process. A full conference slate continues this weekend with the league's current top three teams all on the road. Denver will carry a six-game winning streak into Baxter Arena, while Duluth goes to St. Cloud in a rematch of last year's Frozen Faceoff title game. UND's path this week takes them to Oxford, Ohio to play a Miami team they got familiar with back in November. North Dakota won 7-1 and 5-4 in the Ralph in their first meeting of the season, and they would welcome a similar set of results at Steve Cady Arena this time around. Yeah, I think it's big, especially for Parawise against them. I know they're a little lower, so I mean, we need to get those games, and those are kind of the games that we need to win. And then those points, again, for the NCHC, if we keep climbing the ladder, it's going to definitely help us out in the long run. So, UND Miami, the first two teams to face off in NCHC history, are set to renew acquaintances at an early 5.30 p.m. start time for game number one. That's due in part because Oxford is in the Eastern time zone and because CBS Sports Network is broadcasting the game. Game 2 is at 6 p.m., and that can be seen on nchc.tv. That's our time for this week here on North Dakota Hockey Central. On behalf of our Midco SN crew, I'm Alex Heinert. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the hockey this weekend.